This video is for the real preppers out there, not for those just enamored with daily dose of doom and gloom self-amusement. There's a dark side to this prepping thing, okay? And I've come to realize that the more evolved you get as a prepper, the more vulnerable you actually become. The greater the attack surface, the greater your preparedness empire, the broader the attack surface that can be used against you. Asymmetrically, just like the American empire, how it's so susceptible to asymmetrical guerrilla style attacks, so will the super preppers, the macro preppers, those homesteaders who have all of these intricate systems that they've integrated into the surrounding environment, replicating the critical infrastructure of the modern world on a small scale homestead. You got your water well, you got your solar system, you got your garden, you got your animals, you got your heating system, whatever that may be. All of these complex systems are attack vectors, okay? Now, when I first started out as a prepper, I considered myself what I call micro preppers. I had this distinction called micro, meso, and macro preppers. Micro prepper is the guy living out of the bug out bag. That's where you, everybody starts. Meso prepper is the stockpiling hoarding prepper. They're the ones who store energy in the form of ammo, medication, food, but they have no regenerative component. Maybe they have a small scale, you know, solar system or something. And then you have the macro preppers who are the people who have the self-sustaining systems in place. There's a regenerative component to their preparedness and that is where everybody goes, okay? Every prepper in their journey, they start off as a wandering nomad in the apocalypse and they eventually become a farmer, okay? That's how it is. And this is typically because people are strapped for resources when you first start this. For the first five to six years, of my preparedness lifestyle, I was living out of a bug out bag. I had no meso preparedness. I mean, I did, I had a little bit of rice and beans, but above and beyond that, I was not a stockpiling prepper per se. I was getting prepared to, you know, live and forage and scavenge and have to move, be on the move, be in a non-fixed, non-established uh, position, a non-established mode of resource acquisition. Eventually, you start to, you get a house and uh, you start filling that house with stuff, okay? And ultimately, you end up as a macro homesteader where you requires more land and the systems that you bring into your life cease to be toys and they really become tools. Which is not to say that those toys, like a life straw or a little portable walkie-talkie or uh, some smaller scale implement like a fire start or something. These things all serve a vital function at the beginning, okay? Really all the bug out bag is, it's a microscopic version of the grid because everything that the grid provides, the idea is that your bug out bag is supposed to encapsulate all of that and provide you a real base level meet those needs on a base level, but not allow you to thrive in any sort of way. Now, a meso prepper who stockpiles stuff, they can not necessarily thrive, but they can maintain their standard of living for a finite period of time. The macro self-reliant homesteader who has these regenerative systems in place. And as my buddy Dean always says, there's no such thing as off-grid. I mean, everything that you need to go off-grid required the grid to make. The only true off-grid is maybe, you know, primitive technology or these guys who are, you know, uh, even those guys who are out there digging, making these elaborate projects out of sticks. And we already know that's been somewhat debunked a little bit. But you have to be super primitive in order to be completely off-grid. And that's not something, that's not a way that most of us want to live, right? We're just too adapted to this current way of life. <clears throat> what I'm realizing is that as we progress in this preparedness thing, there's a paradox. Because the more prepared we get, the greater and more vulnerable we are going to be when the shit actually hits the fan.
we are going to be susceptible to all manner of asymmetrical, perpendicular style of attacks. Let's just take some examples. So you got your homestead, you got your 40 acres, maybe more, and you have all of these elaborate systems in place. You have animal husbandry, you have a solar system, you have a water well, maybe you have geothermal, maybe you have a solar, passive solar heating, or some other way of heating your home by fireplace, which requires firewood. Uh, you have an elaborate communication system, you have uh, you know, your own electricity, you're growing your own food. All of these are attack vectors for people with malintent. So let's just say you're out there on your homestead, the shit has hit the fan, there's pockets of dystopia amidst a sea of without rule of law, lawlessness, we'll say. And the response times for the police are basically nil. So you're basically on your own. Now, if I was a marauder, and I seen this massive attack surface, and let's just say I'm a nomadic micro prepper who joined the dark side. There are so many attack vectors. I mean, I could poison your animals. I could uh, burn you out with a wildfire that I could start in the middle of the night. I could uh, shoot out your solar panels and make them not function anymore. Uh, just from a distance, just shoot them with a sniper rifle or something. would be an easy target, big target, right? I could uh, poison your water. I could snipe you. I'm not saying I'm going to do this. I'm just saying these are the things you got to consider, okay? I could put traps. I could survey your land with a drone. And if you don't think that this technology isn't going to be used just because it's Mad Max, you're sadly mistaken. It is going to be some blend of cyberpunk, steampunk, and they're absolutely going to use this stuff. Okay, so you have to have a way to counter it. The only real way to counter something like this is uh, assuming, assuming GPS is not operational, that might limit the feasibility of utilizing something like this for ISR, but uh, they're still going to be able to manually control it. And you can get systems now with telescopic lenses that you would never know it was up in the sky watching you in the first place. And you can get thermal mounted ones that are a little bit more expensive. But this is something that you're going to have to contend with. You're going to have to, I mean, really the only defense against it is electronic warfare. And I don't know enough about that, but maybe we're going to have to do, we're really going to have to look into that at some point in time. Because I do believe that this is going to be one of the greatest threats, not just drones, but just technology and asymmetrical technology used against the broad attack surface that you are trying to create out there in the middle of nowhere. And if you think you're going to hide from, you know, it's going to be impossible to hide from the artificial intelligence, autonomous uh, drones that are going to be out there surveying the land, looking for anomalies that have are already to the point where they're mastering identification. All they got to do is program in, look for a house, look for solar panels, look for these types of uh, contours in the landscape, look for gardens, look for you know anything. They could just program it in, and uh, they'll come and find you. And I'm talking, of course, about not even just the government, but private entities as well. We don't know if there's going to be a government, to be brutally honest. I mean, it, we could see some crazy fracturing, balkanization of the Americas that nobody anticipates. And it's just going to be ruled in little fiefdoms of uh, tech, tech, uh, techno fiefdoms or corporate fiefdom. Who knows? But uh, something you're going to have to contend with is these rogue groups who are employing this level of technology that maybe you're not well versed in, but you should get versed in it. Every prepper should have a drone. Absolutely. You need to have this technology and you need to know how to use it. This is the future of warfare. And basically, you know, I, I, I view preparedness as low intensity warfare in a way. Uh, especially if you're talking about a post-collapse environment. All the tools that are being employed right now, all the, the principles and the strategies, the tactics leveraged in war will just be implemented on a much smaller scale. 
So you have to practice the art of war because the more you bring these systems into your life, I mean, if you got electricity and it's a sea of darkness at night, you're going to stand out like a sore thumb. If you have ammunition that you are training with and you're hunting, that's going to draw lots of attention. So you see what I'm saying? There are drawbacks to every advantage with preparedness. And these are the security minded things you have to take into account. And everybody needs to be on the same page. And you need to shit test your friends and your family before something like this actually goes down. Because if those little minor miscommunication errors and freakouts will become amplified in terms of the consequences that they're going to have in a bad situation. Everybody needs to be emotionally of sound mind and willing to be able to reason and uh, not have their emotions overtake them. Anyways, back to the topic of attack surface. This is really an important concept to understand. When you just have a bug out bag, you're a small target. Okay, when you're just walking through the woods, yeah, you don't have a lot of capability. However, you're a small target. And as that small target, you can inflict a lot of damage. And if you just think that you're going to be able to police everything all the time, and this, of course, is why you need a broader community. But even with a broader community, it's not necessarily a solution for this because the broader the community, the bigger the attack surface, right? And so through a game of uh, attrition and just chipping away, you can do a lot of damage. If you are a person who has a lot of discipline and uh, is cunning and, and uh, sees these attack vectors and sees how vulnerable they are, you could do a lot of damage. And unfortunately, when you are this vulnerable homesteader who could be burned out of their house, who could be you know, seen from a mile away, who could be sniped out when they're out planting the garden or uh, have their communications intercepted or surveyed or have their crops poisoned or stolen or have their uh, cattle uh, rustled, you know, like you could do so much damage just as a person. So this is why empires fall. Okay, this is the main point I want to make in this video is the reason why empires fall is because the attack surface becomes so broad, so complex and dynamic and the intricacy of the system becomes unmanageable and it becomes cost prohibitive to continue to expand. So right now with the American empire, the American empire the reason why it's collapsing is because it lacks any soft power anymore. And it tried to police the planet in the same way that all uh, empires have tried in the past and failed. Is that it tried to do it with brute force. And it was pretty much game over after the Vietnam War. It was all downhill from here from the 70s. You know, there was a few upticks with cheap stuff from China, but that's over now too. Well, it's, it's ending. And the reason why empires collapse. All empires collapse. There's a variety of reasons from, from decadence to people just living more frivolously and forgetting about the principles that made the countries great and blah, blah, blah. The main reason is, is because the amount spent on policing the system becomes unsustainable because you, you're at the whim of such a broad attack surface that our adversaries, I mean, if people really wanted to wage a war on America, do you know how easy it would be? I mean, never mind open borders. I mean, even if there weren't open borders, there are so many vulnerabilities in the grid that, you know, a committed uh, nation state or group, if they were really truly dedicated to the task of bringing down the American empire or uh, uh, causing some kind of friction to slow it down, they could easily do it. Easily. I mean, the Houthis are doing it. This little nation, this very impoverished nation, have brought in maritime trade in that region to a standstill, essentially. And it's caused this massive problem. It's caused prices to explode. It's caused a lot of things not to be able to make it. It's causing inflation. 
So, and that's just one. That's just one of thousands of uh, possible methods of attack. We did an entire video on, I think it was like 30 or 40 different primary modes of asymmetrical attack from cyber to kinetic to, you know, uh, blowing up bridges. I mean, the list goes on. Blowing up dams. Okay, there's so many asymmetrical style, unexpected uh, ways of attack that most people don't consider. Because we always think that we're going to go up against a peer, right? But the thing is, we're not going to go up against a peer necessarily. You're not going to go up against another prepping community. You're going to be raided in the middle of the night by people who have been sizing you up for days and days and you didn't realize it. And they've been sizing you up from such a distance because they can, because they're going to have the technology to do it. It's scary to think about, but this is a reality that you have to consider. Now, the only real way to combat this is to do what all empires do, and that's continue to operate outside your boundary, okay? Because the only, if you just stay within your 40 acres and you don't step out of there and you don't go out into the community and you don't bring the fight to them, then the fight inevitably comes to you and they have the initiative and that's not what you want. So these are all just things that I'm thinking about in taking this next step into macro preparedness because as much as it affords you a lot of freedom, there's an incredible amount of responsibility and you do make yourself a massive target to people who are cunning enough and who have uh, malicious intent and who didn't prepare beforehand and maybe they prepared but you know I've, I've heard a lot of these military guys and no offense to people in the military I know not the majority of people feel this way but I, I can't remember which was it a podcast I heard it on was it value tainment there was some like spec ops guy some navy steel just like joking about how he's going to take other people's shit when uh, the grid goes down. And he's like, you know, why are you doing that? That's just going to be mine when the shit hits the fan. I should probably do a reaction to that. Maybe I'll try to get that guy on the channel just to kind of, you know, really get into the mind of the dark prepper mindset because these are things I want to know. I mean, I don't want to just alienate myself from it. I want to understand these people so I can defend and resist against it, Okay. There are ways to do that. I mean, honestly, you know, I'm really looking at thermal drones. And, and again, this is, in, in a lot of ways, this approach, it's kind of like digging a deeper hole. And maybe this is why the American empire continued to fail because it continued to try to wage war against that which you could not win a war against. You have to leverage soft power, I guess, is ultimately the moral of this video as I ride this stream of consciousness you have to have soft power in the community you have to approach these asymmetrical style attacks asymmetrically that might mean making certain concessions that might mean taking an unconventional approach in these particular situations maybe you get the sense that somebody is sizing you up what are you going to do about it are you going to proactively uh, take them out of the game or are you going to try a different approach? Are you going to try to uh, leverage their capabilities somehow? I, I, I haven't really thought this far ahead in this video. This is all spitballing here, guys. There's no script, no nothing, okay? I'm just trying to think about this because, again, the deeper you go down this rabbit hole, the more vulnerable you're going to be. Sean from My Self Reliance, I'm sure many of you have seen his channel before, a far bigger channel than mine, and we've had him on the channel before. His whole approach, I think, is much more living in tune with the surrounding environment, not so much going there, setting up a bunch of fences and trying to replicate all of the stress of you know, our, our current life that we're trying to escape when we go into that lifestyle. But there's these different types of preppers. So you have Dean over at Arcopia, somebody who I'm probably ultimately 